Hi, this is Marcia. And this is Kelly. We are the two U's of Two U's Fiber Adventures. Thanks for stopping by. You'll hear about knitting, spinning, dyeing, crocheting, and just about anything else we can think of as a way to play with string. We blog and post show notes at Two U's fiberadventures.com and we invite you to join our two use fiber adventures group on Ravelry. I'm 100 projects and I am better in motion. We're both on Instagram and Ravelry and we look forward to meeting you there. Enjoy, Enjoy the, the episode. episode. Hi Kelly. Hey Marsha. I have a fun weekend. Yeah, tell me about your weekend. Lamb Town. It was a lot of fun. I yeah. had a great time. I went for a class. Uh-huh. So I had a, a it's called, it was called um, Spinning for Luster, Spinning for Luster and Shine. And oh, it was okay. a combing class. Uh-huh. Uh, it was also spinning, spinning combed fiber. And okay. it, was, it was Stephanie Galston, and it was really, really good. We had two kinds of Romney fleece and a Wensleydale fleece. Mm-hmm. And she had us ca- sample, you know, do samples of different ways of spinning it. Then that would give us an idea of, you know, how we could get more luster or less luster, how to make sure that we got some shine from it. And then we also had um, techniques for dealing with the the longer wools. So it was really okay. a good class. It was, it was all day. Mm-hmm. It was one of those classes, um, you know, when you take an all-day class, and I like that, but you usually leave the class, like, totally wiped out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this was just not like that at all. She's just so, I don't know, relaxed and pleasant to be around. And not not that other teachers aren't, but it wasn't, you know, she had a she had an agenda. She wanted us to do certain things. She wanted us to get through the, the schedule of what we were doing. But it just, it didn't feel rushed. Mm-hmm. And... It was not a lot her talking, but kind of doing. Mm -hmm. And so you learned it from doing it as opposed to, like, you're sitting there trying to take in a fire hose of information. Right, yeah. So it was really good. So what is the difference between carding and combing? So combing, and she had a variety of different kinds of combs for us to try. And then I I brought the combs that I have that I've had for a long time, but I haven't used very much. Um, but combing, so you, you put the fiber onto the comb and you put it on um, like about, she said about two-fifths of the fiber is behind the comb mm-hmm. and about three-fifths of the fiber is in front of the comb. Okay. And then you, you comb it in such a way that it all stays lined up. Whereas in carding, it kind of all jumbles. I mean, so I, the, even though the in carding the fiber may end up straighter, like it's all li- it's lined up, somewhat lined up. You have the like the each each little piece of fiber has scales on it that go a certain way. Mm-hmm. So in carding, you have scales going both ways, right? And not just the scales going both ways, but the fibers going different ways as well. I mean. A lot of, when I card, I usually put the fiber in a lot. A lot of times, I'm carding longer wool, mm-hmm. and so when I do that, I do put the fiber in, kind of all going the same direction. Okay. But when you pull it off into the bat, you know it kind of springs back, and mm-hmm. when you look at the bat of fiber, you don't see like everything all running parallel. Mm-hmm. Right, they're all kind of tangled together in a way. Okay. And then a lot of times when you spin carded fiber, you you sp- take that that carded fiber and you roll it into a roll log mm-hmm. and you spin for the from the end so mm-hmm. your fiber is kind of in a tube. Yeah. And it's pulling off kind of in a jumbled way, not like a snarl. Mhm. But but not all aligned and straight. Regimented. Yeah, so it captures more <laughs> so carded uh, carded fiber, when you spin it, you capture more air. It has more fuzz, more halo, mm-hmm. more th- little pieces sticking out. So can any fiber be combed, or is it mostly the long wool? Longer, silicone? yeah, okay. the long fibers. I mean, there are there are things called mini combs mm-hmm. that you can use for shorter fibers, but that's not really the kind of combing that we were doing. Okay. 
So, and I think you asked me about about the fibers being not all going in the same direction, like like butt to tip or tip to butt, mm-hmm. and the scales. Right. And I didn't realize when we talked about it before, but after the class, um, I I learned that that is an important part of combing to have them all aligned the same way, and that when you spin, if you spin from the butt end of the fiber, you're like going in the direction of the scales. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of like smoothing everything out even more and making the, your yarn even more lustrous and shiny Mm -hmm. because everything's, everything's not only in the same direction, but you're like smoothing those Mm -hmm. scales down as you go. Okay. So that was really interesting. And then I learned a new technique that I think is amazing. Mm -hmm. I never would have thought of this, but she had us flick card, which is when you take the, you take a card, you take a, either a flick carder, which is a small version of a carding, a hand card, or you Mm -hmm. can even use the full size hand card and you, you open up the fiber at the tip and you open up the fiber at the butt end. Mm -hmm. So the fiber, you hold on to the lock. So it's all just one lock and you open it up at one end and you open it up at the other end. So you have this handful of fiber that's all kind of brushed out, sort mm-hmm. of, right? And then you would spin it, right? That's, you flick the lock and then you spin it. Well, she had us take that flicked lock and sort of embed it down on the hand card. Mm-hmm. So you hold the card, you don't hold the fiber, like your hand card is serving as a distaff and holding your fiber. Oh, okay. So you can't like mess around with it and get your hands in the drafting zone. Mm-hmm. You know, the place where your fiber is supposed to be coming off really smoothly. Right. And your hands aren't supposed to be there. Right. And with long fibers, it's more likely that you're going to get your hands in that region because you have a long drafting zone. Mm-hmm. And so to kind of keep yourself from overhandling the fiber... You don't touch it at all. You put it into mm. the card. and Interesting. Then, yeah, so the hand that would be normally holding the fiber is just holding the hand card, and then you're spinning off of the hand card. Hmm. And, you know, then your fiber doesn't get into, like, a little jumbled, sweaty mat. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you hold on too tight, that sometimes mm-hmm. happens. Mm-hmm. So that was a really cool thing to learn mm. how to do and to practice. But anyways, really fun. Um, there were a few people that I... A couple of people that I knew from the Anne's Web Guild were in the class. And um, coincidentally, remember I talked about that fleece that I was Mm -hmm. bidding on Mm -hmm. against the grandma who bought it for her granddaughter? Right. Well, Melody, that was the grandmother, she Mm -hmm. was actually in the class with me. Oh, cool. (laughs) She was talking about bidding on this fleece, this Corydale fleece. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, that was you. (laughs) Small I, world. Yeah, I was bidding against you. So It's a small, fleecy world. <laughs> very, very. Yeah. So anyway, I, I learned a lot. I'm, I'm excited to use my, my combs. Um, I'm excited to uh, do some combing of some of the long wool fleeces that I have in the garage. So yeah, I got some projects cool. in my mind. We'll see if I actually get to them. <laughs> yeah. Well, and since we were talking about Lambtown, the class at Lambtown, how is Lambtown itself? Is there, I don't know, I've never been, so is there a marketplace? And Yeah, there's, um, there's a sheep barn and sheep, uh-huh. sheepdog demo and shearing oh, demo and a vendor market. And that was fun. At the marketplace, I was able to talk with Mark Hale from Valley Oak Wool Mill, mm-hmm. and I dropped off three fleeces, no, mm-hmm. actually four fleeces, to be processed with her. And talk to her a little bit about about the mill. She was busy, so I think she had a good show. This was her first time there, so um, I think she had a really good a really good show. Uh, so I was able to. That was that was an important part of what I wanted to get done. Mm-hmm. <laughs> get some fleece out of the garage. So I was not really in the market for much. I did not go to the fleece judging because I was not in the market for another fleece 
at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, But I did look at yarn and I I got a skein of yarn, just one. Mm -hmm. Um, And I looked at some of the other things. I looked at the crafts. They had handcraft items. You know, they have a competition. That was really cool. So it's a lot like Black Sheep Gathering, Mm -hmm. just on a much smaller scale. Mm Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it was, nice. a, it was a lot of fun. Saw and a lot of the knockers, the knockers people, mm-hmm. had lunch uh, and spent some time talking with one of our listeners, Alyssa, and her three kids. Mm-hmm. That was fun. She actually made me a project bag and brought it oh, uh, cute. for me. Yeah, nice. darling project bag. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, <laughs> It was has chickens on it, and chi- one fabric is chicken wire, and then the other fabric is chickens. Oh, cute. And three little stitch markers that one has my name, one says to use, mm-hmm. and one says teacher. Mm-hmm. So that was really cool. Nice. Stitch markers hanging off the handle. So, yeah, I'm, I've got my – the yarn I bought at Lambtown is in there, and I'm getting ready to start a sock project. So Very nice. Can I just ask you about the mm-hmm. sheep dog trials? Oh, yeah. What, what were those like? Well, it was a, it was not a trial, really. It was oh. just a demonstration. A demonstration. It okay. was really, really cool. They had, they had quite a few dogs there, maybe six dogs, six or seven dogs um, who went in. And they, they had a group. Each dog had a group of maybe four or five sheep, mm-hmm. half a dozen sheep, something like that. And it's in a really small area. It's not a big field. It's just a little small paddock right near the sheep barn. But they would have the dog go and get the sheep and kind of bring it from one side of that enclosed area to another. They had a gate, like a, they had like barriers, like a chute, making like a Mm -hmm. chute for the sheep to go through. Mm -hmm. And so they, you know, had directed the dogs to move the sheep through the chute. And then there was a little pen area that they would direct the dogs to put the sheep into the pen and it was just and they explained you know that that it's prey chase drive mm-hmm. that actually is behind their work and that they have instincts to to do certain things and then while well, the prey chase drive is the instinct behind almost every kind of dog work there is mm-hmm. whether it's hunt tests or or agility or sh- you know sheep dog Mm -hmm. Uh, things but so it's very it's very interesting and they talked about like certain dogs have certain tendencies um they were saying she was saying that for example the dogs have uh like an instinct to like if you walk clockwise around the sheep then they'll walk clockwise around the sheep sort of covering the area that you moved away from Mm -hmm. so that you keep the sheep between you Okay. They just have this instinct to do that. And so you can control the dog's movement by the way that by the way that you move mm-hmm. in the you know around the sheep. And so I thought that was very interesting and they showed us, you know, watch, I'm not giving any commands at all. And then she would walk in one direction and the dog would m- kind of go not the opposite direction because they were both going clockwise, but mm-hmm. I guess it's kind of, it kind of looks opposite if you think right and left. Right. You know, yeah. she would go to the right and the dog would go to the left. And so that they always kind of kept the sheep between them. Mm-hmm. It, it was very interesting. Hmm. So, but I, I was thinking about how similar, how some of the things are similar to agility, like moving your body a certain way to kind of cue the dog. Yeah. And we did the same thing in obedience. You move your body a certain way to kind of cue the dog what's happening next. And in hunt test too. We did that. And then they talked about how your dog needs to be able to work at a distance from you. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking about, you were saying before about how, you know, it's it's challenging to try to keep up with a dog like Enzo. Um, But what you're working towards is being able to work the dog from a distance. Yeah. Um, So. We talked just a little bit before we started recording, and I I had... um, uh, I have agility with Enzo at noon on Tuesdays, and I came back, and he's exhausted. He's laying on his <laughs> pillow, and I was exhausted. This is a, this is the next level of dog training, and I'm, I'm not even. This is not even the level of what you were, you and Robert were doing with all the hunting and that with the dogs. But you know, this is this is the next level from obedience. Mm-hmm. And you had said there's people that you know they just want their dog to behave. 
and that's it. And then you go to another level where you're now actually looking at working with your dog. And mm-hmm. um, it's like communi- it becomes it becomes yes. communication. And um, I was saying one of the things that was really interesting is that he would um, we had to, there was a series where he had to go over jumps and then go through the tunnel and um, or you know I'm sorry he came out of the tunnel and then he was supposed to go over the jumps and I couldn't get him to go over the the jumps. And the trainer said, well, I'm, I had positioned my body the wrong way. So you have to keep switching. Sometimes you're leading with your right hand. Sometimes you're leading the dog with your left hand. Okay, um, but then yeah. you have to turn. And I would turn, but I didn't <laughs> move my body out of the way. So I was actually sort of blocking where I wanted him to go. So he was just going off, randomly off someplace. <laughs> and um, I also said to you also that... Um, um, that it struck me today is that I'm so, I'm the trainer I'm training Enzo, but Cheryl is training us, and I think the dogs know. <laughs> I think Enzo knows that she's she's training me. So if I don't know what I'm doing, he looks to her. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, oh, that, and, yeah. Um, and when That's he came out of the he came out of the tunnel and he didn't know where to go, he just went over to Cheryl because <laughs> that will leave, <laughs> like I think like. Marsha doesn't know what she's doing, but I think Cheryl's in charge, so she knows. Yeah. So I'll just go over. I'll just go over to her. I'll go to her. She knows. I'll what go she's to her. Doing. Isn't but, that, but isn't the, that nice? Yeah. <laughs> but the thing about it is, you're talking about the communication about the body language, and I think that's really what it is. It's it's probably less the words you're using, saying tunnel and ramp and right. jump and all this stuff. It's really the body language because they know now. If you point to the tunnel, they're supposed to go through the tunnel. I mean, what are your options? You know, I guess you can go around the tunnel, but yeah. you're just going to have to do it again. So, and it's fun to go through the tunnel. So mm-hmm. I think you're, it, it's like what you're saying, it's the body language with the, and, and how you're positioning yourself that helps guide them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So it was, it was very interesting. And it was also interesting, and this happens too in other areas of competition, I know, mm-hmm. um, they were in an enclosed space. The dogs are really excited. They're used to working sheep in a bigger area, right? And not they're not used to working sheep, either the handler or the dog, with an audience because these are working dogs. This wasn't a these weren't trial dogs or right. or like obedience trial mm-hmm. dogs. And even even dogs that show most of the time their work is not for an audience. Right. But so you get an audience, you get pressure, you get the handler feeling pressure, you get the sheep feeling pressure because mm-hmm. it's such an enclosed area, the dog's feeling pressure because of the enclosed area. And then the dog also knows, well, and we saw this at, we saw this at Black Sheep Gathering too. The dog knows that the handler's not going to really make them mm-hmm. in this setting, right? It's mm-hmm. like they can, they can be a little bit naughty. Mm-hmm. And there's no consequences, <laughs> and they just sort of figure that out. Like, mm-hmm. oh, well, she's talking, and she's talking to these people in the bleachers, so she's not really totally paying attention to what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. So I think I can get away with not lying down when she tells me to lie down. Or mm-hmm. uh, it was it was just very interesting. But mm-hmm. that was that's always. I mean, I think that's true. In lots mm-hmm. of settings, if you don't have a hundred percent of your focus on what they're doing, mm-hmm. they can end up taking advantage. <laughs> Same thing with children. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the cho- I always remember with Ben and his friends, like they, oh, like you know, the like a friend would come over to spend the day. Then in the afternoon, the mother or father would come to pick up this kid, and then the parents would start talking, and oh, the kids would just uh-huh. disappear and go off and do something. Yeah, something okay. they shouldn't do. <laughs> okay, little Johnny, you know, your mom's here. It's time to go. And then it's like they're ready to go, and then we start talking, and then they all just disappear, <laughs> get on their bikes and ride off or something. <laughs> Same thing. Oh, my goodness. Anyway. Yeah. It was very fun. Uh, the class was good. I learned a lot. Mm-hmm. I highly recommend taking a class from Stephanie Galstead. She's very good. And it's a low-key setting. And, and mm-hmm. maybe it was low-key in the other classes, too, just because Lambtown is smaller. But it was, yeah. it was just a really relaxing relaxing yeah. class, and it was a relaxing, uh, a relaxing festival. Very nice. I didn't feel super tired at the end well, of it. Well, someday I'll get down there. Was, yeah. it, was it really hot down there? That's so no, it was not hot. 
it was it was cool in the mornings and you know it was up it got up to the high 70s maybe 80 uh by late afternoon mm-hmm. and then you know that didn't last very long before then it was you know it was yeah uh nightfall so in the past it's been in the hundreds hasn't it yeah there have been years when it's been really hot yeah and I haven't been there in a really super uncomfortable year. I'm, this is only my third time in recent years that I've been there. So, but yeah, it's really, I, I, I would recommend it. It's really good. Okay. It's fun. Someday. Yeah, yeah. I'll get down there. So, yeah, well, this this was somewhat fiber related because we were talking about lamb town and fiber classes, but let's get into the knitting projects. Yes. Are we ready to talk projects? Yes, we are. Do you want to uh, go first, or sure? Because I only have one. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that's not entirely. That actually, that's not entirely true. I'm lying. I have two. Okay. One knitting project, one weaving project. Okay. So my knitting project is running water, mm-hmm. and I have it with me right now. I'm working on it a little bit right now. I got all the way down the body, and. I'm now to the ribbing, and I decided to do in my stripes. You know what I did in the stripes because you saw it on Instagram, right? Yes, the math. (laughs) And I figured out the math. I was looking at the numbers. I was trying to figure out, like, yeah. And anyway, I figured it out. Okay, so okay. Now don't. Now you're gonna don't test me on it right now. No, I won't. I promise. (laughs) And I'll tell the listeners what I did in case they didn't see it. So I have two colors, and I couldn't figure at the last time we spoke I wasn't sure what I was going to do in terms of the color the color blocking or striping with the teal it's kind of a dusty teal color it's called illusion that's the name of the colorway so I was debating and hemming and hawing and trying to figure out what to do and getting to a point where I thought I should probably start doing something with color Mm -hmm. and I was looking through the pattern to see, like, how much more I had. And all of a sudden, I saw that I had 21 rows of ribbing. And, of course, when a math teacher is trying to figure out a striping sequence and sees that one of the blocks of things has 21 rows, what does she immediately think of but the Fibonacci sequence? <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so the Fibonacci sequence, if, if you're not familiar with it, is a sequence that it starts with one, and then the next number is also one, and then you add those two together, so the next number is two, and then you add the previous two numbers together, so the two and the one, so the next number is three, and then if you're following... So the, the the last number is 3, and the number before that is 2. So you add those together, and so the next number will be 5. Mm-hmm. Am I making sense? This is kind of a visual yes. thing. It's hard, to, it's hard to know if it's making sense. So now you have 5, and the number right prior to the 5 was a 3. And so 5 and 3 is 8. And then 8 and 5 is 13. And then um, the 8... And the 13 together make 21. So 21 is one of the numbers in the Fibonacci Mm -hmm. sequence. So then I backed it up. And I I think I had to undo a couple of rows to make it work. You know, I had gone a little bit too far. So I did a row of the green. And then in between each of the green rows, I have two rows of the the camel color or the cashmere color. Mm -hmm. So I have a row of green, two rows of of cashmere another row of green so that's the one one two rows of cashmere and now i've got the two rows of green and the two rows of cashmere and then i go to the three rows and in between each i have the two rows of cashmere so then after three rows i have five rows and then i have eight rows and 13 rows and then i have my 21 rows of ribbing so okay i um i'm done with the ribbing and now i have you ever done a tubular bind off uh, um, I don't, I thought I had, but maybe I, I think I did, a, is there a tubular cast on? There, yes. I there's think a I tubular did that. cast on and there's a tubular bind off. And okay. the tubular bind off actually involves Kitchener. Oh, I was going to say wine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it better involve wine. I think that might have been my problem. 
because, <laughs> because oh. I I started it. So you're you have one by one ribbing. So I guess it only works for one by one ribbing okay. because you have one by one ribbing. So you take all the knit stitches are like one side. You do a couple of setup rows, which involve slip stitches. So what mm -hmm. you end up with is all your knit stitches are like on one needle, like a sock mm -hmm. graft Kitchener stitch where you have mm -hmm. two needles. So all your knit stitches are on the front needle, and all your purl stitches are on the back needle. Oh. And because of the setup rows with slipping, it actually is a, a little bit like you've just split the fabric in half. Mm -hmm. So you have like two layers of fabric at this point. And then you take those two layers of fabric and you Kitchener them together. Oh. So it's really very cool. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. So then it makes, so what's the finished project? Let me look at you. Do you show the edge? No, I'm, your, no uh, because I had to rip it out. Oh, oh okay. So what happens is like if you think about your ribbing, so you're on one side of the ribbing, and it's just like it kind of wraps around to the other side of the ribbing. Mm -hmm. So instead of having like a ridge across the bottom, yeah, you end up with just like a, it just wraps. I mean, it's almost like you had two layers that wrap together, but it's really only one yeah, layer. It sounds like it'd be a really nice finish. It's a really nice finish for, but it, but I. If you can get past I, doing it. <laughs> yeah, well, and I don't know if you can do it on anything other than one by one rib. Oh, okay. Uh, I guess you could do it on a two by two rib, but you'd have to, you, there, there would be some other skill involved that I don't know mm -hmm. about. Uh, so, so yeah, it's really nice, but you have to be able to Kitchener successfully. And so if you think about the, like the rib, you know, the, the knit, the, like the knit rib going up mm -hmm. and it's supposed to meet with the ribbon back. Right. Right. So what happened was, I don't know, about two inches into my Kitchenering, the rib went up and met with the rib like two over. Mm. And so suddenly I have this slant mm. <laughs> going on and more stitches on. Basically, I ended up with more stitches on one needle than the other. Mm -hmm. You know, they weren't, they weren't matching up evenly. And so yeah. I had this slant. So I had to undo it. So I haven't re-Kitchenered the bottom of my tubular bind-off, but I do really like this bind-off. It's going to be really nice. And so now I'm working on the sleeves, and I have the sleeves. One sleeve I have to the point where I think I need to start doing something with color. Mm -hmm. So maybe about five inches long from the armpit, six inches long from the armpit. And then the other one is about maybe three inches long from the armpit. So... Once I get them both to the same length, then I have to figure out, I think I'm going to do the same pattern, the same Fibonacci, but I might not go all the way to 21. I might just do the small version of What's it. What's the other number, the, the other numbers you can use? 13, 8, 5, 3, mm -hmm. 2, and 1. Oh, so that's I could right. like oh, okay. go. So I could oh, like go course. up to 5. <laughs> yeah. I could like go, maybe, maybe just go up to 5. Some of it depends on how much yarn I have left. So I have this coned yarn, and when I get the two sleeves the same, I'm going to unwind it from the cone and then separate it into two balls mm -hmm. so I don't have any surprises of running out. <laughs> you know, on a cone, you can't tell yeah. how much you have left. Right. So as soon as I get both sleeves to be the same, the about six inches, I'm going to uh, break my yarn, and then I'm going to take the yarn off the cone so I can so I can more easily divide it and also mm -hmm. so I can weigh it yeah without having to estimate what the weight of the actual cardboard cone is mm -hmm. so I can use it to the very very last bit play yarn chicken mm -hmm. so <laughs> but I'm I'm pleased with it and I've got the sleeves are big enough they're not too tight which is good so, yeah, that's it, my it, uh, running okay. water. Okay. And your other project. Oh. Oh, the weaving. It's the weaving. weaving. Mm -hmm. So I put, I maybe talked about this on my, on the last episode. I don't know. We missed a week, so I think maybe I didn't. I actually got the garage cleaned out and I got the big 
64 inch wide loom into the garage and I warped it and I started weaving a, a pad for my for my loom bench. Yeah. So last episode you were talking about you were going to do this. Start okay. This. And so, but now you've actually got it on yeah. the loom. Mm-hmm. And how is it setting it up on that? Because you've got how many, and, well, your goal also is to use more than four. Um, right. I used six. Um, I used six of the, of the shafts. So I found a six shaft pattern. What I, what I discovered was I'm used to just going, running to my Marguerite Davison book, mm-hmm. which is a book of four shaft weaving drafts. Oh, so so I didn't have like handy. I need to I need to find myself a a nice. It's kind of like a stitch dictionary for weavers. I need mm-hmm. to find myself a nice one of those for for more than four shafts because I was impatient to get started. I wanted a pattern. It wasn't like I was going to go buy a book on Amazon and wait for it to arrive or go to the library and mm-hmm. check something out. So I just found something online and popped it on the loom. And so there wasn't a lot of forethought to the the threading that I used. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's interesting. It, it's doing something that I wasn't able to do with just four shafts. Mm-hmm. And I'm kind of experimenting. And it's kind of a sampler, you know, just a long, skinny sampler Mm-hmm. trying different things and I'm using up the last of the bulky yarn well I don't know if it's the last of it but I'm using up the yarn that I spun for the couch and sweater oh right yeah I had quite a bit of that left over so so I thought oh, I'll just use this it's I'm using that as weft mm-hmm. so I have the light brown and then I had spun a dark brown when I wasn't sure if I was going to use brown or gray and so I, I'm weaving with the, the gray's all gone, but I'm weaving with the dark brown and the light brown. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, okay. I'm, ha- I'm happy with it. It's fun. It's not particularly beautiful or stunning or anything like that, but, but it's doing, it, it, it got me weaving on this loom and it, I was stuck. Yeah, I was and I so intimidated the, by that loom yeah. that. Yeah. I say that's the, it doesn't matter how uh, stunning it is. It's got you going. So that's the yeah, main thing. Yeah. yeah. I figured out how to t- do the tie-ups because my other loom, you tie the, the treadles connect, the treadles that you use on your, your feet on connect to the harnesses with, there's little mm-hmm. cords that you attach them. And this one had these metal things and I wasn't even sure how to use them. Mm-hmm. But once I just said, okay, I'm going to figure this out, and I went and I looked at it, and it's like, oh, I see very clearly how these attach. I don't know. It just seemed much more complicated than it actually was, mm-hmm. which is pretty much a, a thing in life, right? Isn't that mm-hmm. just kind of the way most things that you think are complicated probably seem more complicated than they actually are once you sit right. down and do it? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's true. So those are my two projects. Okay. All that right. I've worked on. There's also the crochet uh, papel picado that I have not worked on. Yeah, well, and time's running out, Kelly. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not that. Nine, I, I think. I'm not that intrigued by them anymore. Okay. <laughs> Once I learned how to do fillet crochet, mm-hmm. I sort of got out of being intrigued. It wasn't as mm-hmm. complicated as it looked. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, what um, about you? So, my projects, I have finished something. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so, I finished um, Eba by Bon Marie Burns. That's the um, sweater that I was making out of the Rambouillet. Nice. And that, I had, that I had to rip out uh-huh. and re-knit. So, yeah, so, your goal was to finish it by the end of the month? Or finish it when you went to Seabrook. Yes. Okay. So let me, I'm going to go back to my, because I have to, I, I do have to tell you just my, my dates. Okay. <laughs> I'm imp- I, I impressed myself. <laughs> um, so I originally, I cast on August 1st and it was going to be finished before Ben got back from mm-hmm. Alaska. And then. So that was going to be pro- like in a month, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it, what is, how, are there 30 days in August? Um, yes. Whatever. 31. Anyway. 31. Okay. Anyway, I, but then I had my problem. So I ripped the whole thing out and I cast on again, um, uh, the first of September 
And I finished it September 27th. Oh, my gosh. 27 days. (laughs) Oh, that's fantastic. (laughs) This is why my rear end is so large and flabby. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Oh, but you have a sweater. (laughs) I love the fit of the sweater. Uh, It's it fits really it's raglan sleeve or shoulders you know mm-hmm. and it fits really well through the shoulders oh that's good and it's and it's roomy through my um ample rear now <laughs> 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 i brought it to with me we were at the beach for a week and um, i finished it down there but i do have a bit of a problem it's not technically done um oh. because i finished what i did is i always do this now with sleeves is I I finish all of the 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 decreases and you know top down I finish the decreases, put the sleeve on um, and get to sort of approximately the length I think I want it to be, and then I put that on that first sleeve on waist yarn, and I keep track of my rows and then I knit the second sleeve keeping track of the rows and then I put that sleeve on waist yarn, and then I um, put it on and have someone kind of have someone measure for me. Uh, and so I did that down at the beach, and they fit perfectly at the beach. And then I brought it home, and I washed and blocked it. And the sleeves grew. Oh. So now there, I have to rip back. I would say probably, I have to remove, well, whatever the, the, the it's a broken rib is the band, the, the cuff. Mm-hmm. And that's 10 rows. I basically need to rip back that much and another 10 rows and then do the cuff. So Ooh, if I that's it, not it, bad. It, so it's not bad. No. But I and I what I also have learned with sweaters now too with the sleeves is I know they can grow or sometimes they end up they think they're going to be long enough they end up being too yeah. short. So now what I do is I I weave in the ends to the rest of the sweater but I don't weave in the ends on the sleeve. After, and then when I wash and block it I can see how it fits in it. It's a lot easier than to to unravel that if you haven't woven in those ends. So I anyway I haven't done anything about it on on Saturday I had dinner with um, Kim and K Magnon Des- or K M Designs on uh, Ravelry and she measured it for me so now I'm gonna I just have to find some time to to fix it but I have to say I love the pattern and I love the yarn it really is I don't know poofy and delicious yeah. and silky kind of They're really really nice and I think it's a great pattern uh, fits really well very nice so. So I finished that, and then I'm almost done with the shawl that I started uh, to take on the plane when I went to Scotland in March, the Alenia by mm-hmm. a- uh, Amba O'Brien, and it, there's a Pico bind-off, and I'm about halfway done with that. But I'm not working on that while we record because I can't talk and do it at the oh, same time. Oh, yeah, no. Keep, Pico bind-off is of, too much. It's very fiddly and... Mm-hmm. Um, like yeah, I so love I, the way wow. they look. I know. Yeah, I've done it That's on a really few nice. different shawls. Yeah, and I remember thinking, I don't think I'll ever do this again. <laughs> I've done it on a couple of shawls, and I don't know why. Because it is it, well, I think it does look nice, but it is. It fiddly. looks really nice. And, yeah, and, and uh, the other thing too is it's sort of challenging to block too because, and I don't know how everybody does this, but I put those blocking wires through each little point. Mm-hmm. But if you have three hundred to fifty little points, or it's whatever, a lot it's, of it's a lot it's of a lot fiddling of, to block. Yes, yes, it's it's fiddly to bind off and it's fiddly to block. Mm-hmm. But but very pretty. But it does, yeah, it looks nice. I I I always admire the. I've seen pico bind offs with beads. Mm-hmm. I think oh that would be kind of cool too. But mm-hmm. again, <laughs> do I really want to do a pico bind off? <laughs> so. <laughs> So that's almost done. And then I started two new projects. Oh. And I, I just have to do a little side, a little uh, side uh, note about what I did. Is, so when we went down to Seabrook, uh, it's actually, Seabrook is a community in the town of Pacific Beach, Washington. Uh, we went down there, we were there for a week, and I, we pull into town, pull into the rental office to go get the you know, the code to get into mm-hmm. our house. And I, and my brother was driving and I said to him, the good thing is there's nothing to buy down here. <laughs> I won't be spending any money because there's nothing to buy down here. And I literally turn my head and I look across the street and I am not kidding. There's a yarn shop. <laughs> 
and I said, oh, oh I said, oh, expletive. <laughs> There's a yarn shop. Anyway, so I just want to tell you about it. It's called String Theory Yarn and Fiber. It's in Seabrook, Washington. And uh, I'll put this in the show notes. Their um, uh, website is just stringtheoryyarnandfiber.com. And it's owned by Jean Chambers, and who actually lives down there in Seabrook. And she just opened this up, um, well, since June. Um, because I was going to say, you didn't know anything about we, a yarn. There wasn't anything like this before. No, and we were there in May, middle oh, okay. of May, I think, and and it was not there. And then, uh, well, I don't know when they opened up because she said she, she and her husband have had a house down there for a number of years in the rental pool. They just pulled it out of the rental pool and are living. They're going to now live there year round. Okay, and that happened in June. Yeah. So sometime that they opened up the shop, so it's very nice. And because I was down there for a week, I was able to go to their knit night that they have on Thursdays. Oh, fun! And so that was really fun. And there was about nine of us, I think, there. And um, now I I think this is really cute. So you on either side of the yarn shop, there's a there's a wine shop and um, a wine tasting cheese shop on one side. On the other side is the pub. And so um, they say she says you know you just can go in there and you can buy your a pint or a glass of wine or whatever you want to buy at either of these places. And then they'll just let you take the glass and go back to the yarn shop and drink it. So I didn't bring any, I didn't have anything, but um, uh, people had wine and, and then there was this uh, couple shows up and the wife, I, well, I assume they were a couple. They seemed like they were together, but um, she was knitting and he didn't know how to knit. So he sat there and he said he bought two skeins of yarn and he wanted someone to show him how to knit. So there's this woman, and she said, well, if you go next door and buy me a beer, I'll show you. Oh, so, <laughs> so I he, love it. They, <laughs> so uh, he, gets a, she, he gets her a pint of beer, and then she shows him how to, to, to knit. So that was really fun, and just talking to people. So that, that was really – so if anybody goes to Seabrook and you're there on a Thursday, she said she has the knit night pretty much every Thursday. So that was really fun. And then – but I want to tell you what I bought. So I bought um, – a skein of, um, or a ball of, it's called uh, Concentric by um, Hiku, by Skasel. Okay. I never know if it's pronounced Skasel or Skasel, but it's um, called Concentric. It's 100% alpaca. Kim was with us the first part of the week, and she bought one for herself out of like a, it runs from like a, I think it runs from like a white to a gray to a pink. Really interesting. Oh, so it's um, like a gradient? It's a gradient, okay. yeah. And what's interesting about it is it's, Three, or excuse me, it's four singles, but it's the the these four singles are not plied together. Oh, so it's if that makes sense. Yeah. So it's kind of, and so then each single, um, it sort of reminds me in a way of the um, what's that shuffle ball or whatever mm-hmm. you know where the they you know they'll ply uh, the colors together, but the color it's it's a gradient. Um, but the colors overlap, right. so there's not a hard break. Mm-hmm. And so this is the same thing where the singles change at different times. Okay, yeah. So even though they're all moving, the, um, so then my Mark went in with me a couple of days later, and he fell in love with that ball of yarn. He wanted, it. and they had a um, pattern, just a free Ravelry download that they had knit up a scarf, and it's called the scarf is called Slack Tide by Post Stitch. And so I just, I bought the, the ball of yarn for him and went home and just downloaded the pattern. So I've started, I've cast on and I started knitting with that. So it's kind of cool. So it's a gradient. And so he, the one he got moves from a, a teal to kind of a... Oh, I see. Yeah. There, there's some lavender. It sounds weird. This is a man's scarf. It's going to be a man, but he loved the color. So it kind of moves from a teal to a lavender to a kind of a gray mm-hmm. and a little bit of a mauve in there too. And but the singles they're all moving through that color palette, but the singles change at different times. Right. So it really sense. so it really moves smoothly from one color yeah. to another. That's nice. Yeah. And it's really nice. It's, well, that hundred percent alpaca. Paca, yeah. so you know what that feels like. And so he's so I, I cast that on. and It's going pretty fast because it's ten and a half needles, size ten. Oh yeah. So. Anyway, and then the other thing I bought down there, and I will get back to my projects, but the other thing I bought is um, uh, two skeins, and I have to get my notes here because I want to get this right. Um, 
two skeins of yarn called Lina, L-I-N-A, and it's 100% merino. And the reason I bought it is I wanted to support the shop, um, but then also uh, Lena is... Of course. <laughs> well, and I helped her out. So I'll tell you what I bought. So, Because what she's really trying to do, like many yarn shops, is um, source local right. pro- you mm-hmm. know, products from the local producers. So um, Lena Fine Yarns and Textiles, and I'll put a link to their website. Um, it's all uh, 100% merino. She also had, I didn't buy it, but she also had um, merino alpaca blends. But um, the, the owner's name is Lynn. I don't have a last name for her, but she owns Olympic Yarn and Fiber Mill in Montesano, uh, Washington. And so she is mills the yarn. It's all dyed by someone, uh, a company called Fiber Play, an independent dyer who's in Aberdeen, Washington. So this oh, is all wow. in the same area. And even the label is printed in Aberdeen. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah. And so then the cool thing is when you go to her website – you can put in the lot number and it will tell you who grew, who produced the fiber. So oh. I bought two skeins um, of uh, kind of a, and they're natural dyes. So the, I bought a skein of, um, was dyed with in, indigo and another one is indigo and marigold. So it's kind of a, I say pea green. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I, I bought the two skeins and I put in my number and it was, uh, produced by Vashon Marinos on Vashon Island. So that's kind of cool that you can see who the grower was. That or is producer cool, or yeah. I thought that was really fun. We should uh, and then, we should steal that idea. Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> For our shop, yeah. That yeah, is cool. That's a good idea. They won't care that we steal that idea. I'm no. sure they won't. Oh, well, it's not um, really stealing the idea. I mean, it's letting people know where the yarn yeah. came from, but Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then the other thing I bought down there too is like I, I I don't need another project bag, but this one was so cute. It's like an it goes over your shoulder, and it has um, it's a uh, uh, navy blue on the inside with white polka dots. On the outside, it's Volkswagen buses. And I'm a oh sucker for yeah, uh, mm-hmm. and it's, it has the same V shape that you know that we had when I was a kid. Our Volkswagen bus had that. So, and that was also local and. Um, uh, from Ocean Shores, which is just down the highway from uh, Seabrook, and it's uh, the company is Ocean Rose Designs. And I looked her up online, and I she has an Etsy shop, but I didn't see the bag. So I'm gonna between now and the time we post this episode, I'll see if I can do some more research and find her Etsy shop or her website. Okay, and post that. Um, so anyway, that was kind of. It was fun. It, 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 like, I, what a nice I surprise. Like I, I know. I was like, okay, I'm not buying, and I'm not buying any yarn. Oh, yeah, uh-huh, sure. <laughs> okay, and then my other project is we have our learn-along going mm-hmm. on. And so I've been debating, but I, I still want to take a color work class, and I still will do that to finish my um, uh, tea cozy. Mm-hmm. But I finally decided I just, I'm just i going to do a sock. I want to do an afterthought heel um, and toe. Mm-hmm. And so I was looking online for patterns. And I, um, because we talked about this in the last episode, uh, we have a listener, Pippin67. And she posted a um, video tutorial in... The discussion thread. Oh, I saw and, that. Yeah. Yeah. So I watched that one, and and in the tutorial, what the um, they've done is they just they just you can either just cast on or you can do a provisional cast on, and then you just knit it. You just knit a tube until the yarn is gone. Okay. Yeah. Or or you yeah. can or you can save some out if you want to have the same yarn for the heel and the toe, um, or and the cuff. Mm-hmm. I I'm going to make mine all contrasting. But in the tutorial, they knit the whole thing as a tube. They figure out the center, um, put in um, waist yarn to hold the stitches, and cut out that those center stitches. So then you now have your two mm-hmm. socks. And then there's a uh, they show you how to then figure out where to put the heel, and put in the waist yarn to hold those stitches and cut the heel. And then you go on and, and you do the heel. Then you go on and do the toe. And then you go back and do the cuff. So I. Wow. Thought. So anyway, I I don't have a pattern, Kelly. I'm channeling you. (laughs) 
I don't have a pattern. Well, but you have a tutorial. That's almost the same. I have a tutorial, but as I was looking, as I say, I was looking online for patterns, and then I, you know, so many of them come small, medium, large. I don't mm-hmm. know what size I want, blah, blah, blah. So I thought, you know what? I think I can just do this without mm-hmm. following an actual paper pattern. I think I can just follow that tutorial. So I, and the, I have cast on. I did a provisional cast on, and the yarn I'm using is when we were in, at uh, Stitches uh, in uh, last February, I bought um, Leading Men Fiber Arts Soliloquy um, sock yarn. Mm-hmm. It's the 100% BFL, and I think you bought some too. I did, yeah. And the colorway is Man of Mystery, and it's kind of um, has a little bit of teal and navy and gray. Um, kind of denim look I uh-huh. think um and so I decided to make a pair of socks for my brother and because also and I, I am getting kind of off topic a little bit but I realized I've said this before is that I have this stash of yarn and I'm using up the stash making things for myself so all I'm really doing is just taking my stash and putting it in another form but it's still <laughs> in the house so I thought it's time to start knitting things for other people. Get some so of that I, yarn out of your house. Yes, out of my house. So I'm I'm knitting these socks for him. That's good. And um, so what I've done is I've did a provisional cast on. I'm knitting my – oh, what I first decided – I have to back up for one second. What I first thought I was going to do is um, I want to use up all the yarn and there's, it's like 600, it's over like 650 yards, I think. Mm-hmm. And so what I did is I wound the yarn from a skein into a cake. Then from the cake, I wound them into two separate cakes that were equal weight. Mm-hmm. Um, it's 150 grams. So I made each one 75 grams. And the idea, and then, you know, cut them and ha- cut it. So I had the two separate balls thinking, I'm just going to knit two tubes. Right. And not do that other cutting. But now that I'm knitting on it, I realize that it is forming sort of a pattern, um, sort of a spiral of the the teal and then the, the navy and gray. Mm-hmm. It, if you look at it, it's sort of like a barbershop pole mm-hmm. kind of twisting yeah. up. And so now I'm kind of thinking maybe I if I, now that I've broken the yarn and I do it, I cast on, it may not happen the same way. Now... Having said that, I'm not so particular that I want to have on my socks. Like, I don't care if my stripes match or don't match. Right, right. But I kind of think if I'm going to do all this cutting, I might as well just do it full-on cutting. Yeah. And do what she does yeah. and just make that long tube and then just cut it in mm-hmm. half. So I think what I'm going to do is re- reattach my yarn and just keep knitting the tube. That sounds good because that will be something you've never done. I mean, I mean not just not just the afterthought heel but the whole mm-hmm. thing that's a lot of stuff you haven't ever done before yeah, yeah very cool so and then i have one other little thing i want to say about this project so it's not about the so that's all i have for projects i don't have any anything else mm-hmm. going on but i did decide and splurge and buy myself a set of signature needles oh yeah oh my god <laughs> so i was shocked like Kelly, you and I get needles from the D-stash, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I can't even remember the last time I bought a pair, of, a set of needles, because I, I have all these that I've gotten at different D-stash rooms mm-hmm. that, I, you know, I, like, and I And somebody's tend, grandmother, and yeah. Yeah, like I, a, a friend, a friend, her, her mother had passed away, and she gave me all of her needles, and so yeah, I, I really I never hardly ever buy needles. Yeah. So um, anyway, I bought these and they're shockingly expensive. <laughs> That's the first <laughs> thing I'm going to say. I'm over that now, but I've been knitting with them, and I don't know what how other people feel about them. But you know, uh, many many knitters rave about how great they are. Mm-hmm. I'm not quite in that camp, and I'll tell you why. I I like the fact that they're really they're very pointy, so it's a lot easier to knit the. What I was always knitting on was just bamboo needles because that's what I had in my stash, and I found that the you know the tips are quite rounded, yeah, kind of blunt, and also they the niches the stitches did not slide very well on the bamboo. Mm-hmm. And I had another pair of metal that 
slid so much that the needles that would just slide right out. So these are nice because they, they don't slide out, but they all the stitches slide pretty well on the needle, but not to the point where you're, the needle's just falling out. But the tips of them are like this, they, you know, their big claim to fame is a surgical stainless steel. And then the, that's the, kind of the silvery color. Mm-hmm. And then the body of the needle is green. And like a dark forest green. Well, I have two comments. First of all, that that tip is only about a half inch long, but my my live my working stitches past that. It's on the green, so I'm using dark blue on dark green. And I <laughs> I wish they had made the I wish they had made the tip longer, like an inch long. Mm-hmm. So then you would be knitting on the silver because I hardly ever if I have dark green needle, needles, I'm hardly ever making any socks that are light colored I'm using using dark colors so that's the only thing is I wish that that I don't mind the color I just wish that silvery tip had gone down further right where you're and the other thing I'm finding is where the silver joins the green there's a little catch oh and I don't know if that's normal but it you have to get your yarn past that little catch Hmm. and I don't know if that's something like the more like you you have to just wear that down as you knit and knit and knit that it will I don't know I, that's the only thing for, I, I think that's kind of, for me, mm-hmm. that's a bit of a design flaw. I would like to have, because, I mean, do you, do you knit, what color are your double pointed needles when you knit with them? What are they? Well, I, a are lot you? of times use the birch needles. So they're light, you know, they're light wood color. Yeah. And I said, and bamboo. then I, I have some silver ones. And then I also have some white plastic ones that I use. Uh-huh. Yeah. So all of my needles are light. Light. Yeah. And I, all mine are light They're I don't know if they're butch or butch. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Birch or I think they're bamboo. bamboo yeah. But they're light color. Yeah. And I just like, I don't think, I don't really want to have sock needles that are dark color because I'm always knitting dark yeah. socks. Well, now, so. and I, at Lambtown, I bought myself two pair, two sets of needles for lace, so really small. Mm-hmm. One set is zeros or double zeros, I think. Mm-hmm. Zeros or double zeros, I can't remember. And they're uh, double points. And they're the carbon ones. Mm-hmm. So they have the same thing. I'm going to experience that difference between what the tip is made of and what the needle is made of. I haven't tried to use them yet. But if I'm knitting lace, I'm probably going to be knitting with, like, natural color cotton or something like that. So it won't matter that the needles are dark. In fact, it'll be better that the needles are dark. Better, yeah. So, yeah, and then the other set I made that I bought are, they go on to, they're called twists, and they're the tips for circulars. And so I have the cable that I bought, but they have a little hole in them where you put mm-hmm. a, a a little thread, a sewing thread for a lifeline. Mm-hmm. So your lifeline just drags along with you while you're knitting. So I have a qu- maybe I just knit but they're weird, silver. But, I don't, but when you know how on a knitting needle, mm-hmm. how it's the pointy bit, mm-hmm. right? And then it's a little tiny, and then it starts getting bigger and bigger and bigger till it joins the body, mm-hmm. right? And then you have that body, which is, so I'm on size ones. So when you're knitting, are you knitting, is your stitch on the widest part of the needle, or is it on the tip of the needle? Well, mine, and this is why I always have, my gauge is always too tight, I knit on the very tips of the needles. Ah. But that's, that's part of why my knitting is is so tight and then when I have to do things like knit two together or you know that my stitches on the needle are really firmly on the needle when they get to the wide Mm -hmm. part of the of the needle yeah my live stitch is down on the the bigger part of the needle the the full-sized part of the needle yeah yeah, well, I, honestly, it's it's like right where it joins the body, mm-hmm. like right on that. Oh, and that's so that's thing. kind it's of an awkward confused. place. Yeah, it's awkward because it's right where the green joins the silver, mm-hmm. and so that forms a. I don't know. It, it, it. I don't know. I don't know if I'm explaining it. I find them not. I wish they were just silver, right? And they don't match your. They don't match your knitting ergonomics or whatever your knitting mechanics. Yeah, because of where that falls. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Well, you might get used to them the more you, the more you knit yeah. with them, and when you knit with those, you'll maybe have a slightly different 
technique. Well, and then, uh, um, so here's another thing is I've stabbed myself a couple of times because they are so <laughs> pointy and sharp. I've heard about that and happening. Then, um, and this is another way to keep your dog off the sofa. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Enzo was stabbed by your signatures? <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, now that's an interesting um, thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway. Oh, funny. I think that's all I have for projects. Okay. And, of course, I'm always thinking of something next. But. Right. Well, and I have some, some projects in the works, but nothing different than what we talked about last time. So, and, and since I was just talking about this sock, this afterthought mm-hmm. heel sock that I'm doing, it was part of our, our November learn-along. So we just touch, just touch base about that, too, about just the, oh, the date? Oh, yes. And- it ends the end of November. Post your projects in the finished object thread. We have quite a few. There's, it's been fun to watch. There's um, one of our listeners, and shoot, I don't have her name handy, um, but she's been making crochet squares. So mm-hmm. like a single crochet, practicing learning crochet, single crochet, double crochet, half double crochet. Now she's doing, the last one she posted was a hexagon, a crochet hexagon. Uh, mm-hmm. And her goal, she wants to make one of those African flower animals like my hippo. Mm-hmm. So that's been fun to see uh, the, the things that she's been posting that she's made. There's been some interesting projects. There's an entrelock crochet uh, shawl that Amy Greenhook posted. And, uh, yeah, anyway, it's been fun. We'll talk more about everything that's in there at another time. But, but yeah, the last yes, day is the 31st of November. Well, and I'm just, uh, okay, so I'm just thinking about my sock, too. Just uh, bear with me. Mm-hmm. I have knit... Eight inches. Let's see. I started this on, I'm looking, October 4th. And this is October 9th, Mm -hmm. right? And I would say I've knit conservatively, we'll say, eight inches. Okay. So I should weigh. What What I'm really wondering is, can I knit this entire tube and do all of the cutting, everything, by... The 30th. Or the, How big do you yeah. want your back end to be? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> well, I don't really want it any bigger. I got to figure out how, how to get one of those little bags that holds your, your yarn. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, and then I can walk. Like, I can walk the dog, just attach the leash to my, my belt or yeah. something, and then like walk and knit. And that sounds I hard. Down, I mean, I know people I'll, do it, but that sounds hard to me. That takes the fun out of walking and the fun out of knitting. <laughs> <laughs> Just makes it, yeah. Uh, anyway. I couldn't resist because <laughs> yeah. you were talking about how fast you did your sweater. <laughs> yes, I know. I don't want my backside any bigger, but it will get bigger if I just sit and knit all the time. So, anyway. No, I don't know. I think maybe I can finish them. Yeah, I think you could. I think I can. Yeah, no, I, I definitely think you could finish them. Mm-hmm. So that, right. yeah. I might have to pull a, I might have to pull a couple of all-nighters. <laughs> I might have to have, like, a double feature of movie watching to get it done. Okay. <laughs> right, right. Find something you anyway. really want to see. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, yeah. I think it's it's definitely doable because we're – it's that's the end of November. It's two months. Mm-hmm. It's a little less than two months, so I think you could do yeah. it. Yeah. I think I can do it. Okay. All right. No. So, and, Oh, and by the way, we have – for prizes, we have – uh, patterns. Let me just, let me just um, mention this again. Small Bird Workshop, Catherine Knudsen, her patterns. She's offering uh, five patterns for prizes for our, for our uh, learn along. And we'll also have uh, some of our yarn available as prizes for the learn along, the two use, the two use yarn. So we have some good prizes. Woo-hoo. Yeah. <laughs> So thinking of our yarn, yeah. Should we, let's talk about the shop. Okay, good. We have some fall yarns. We have a, a last time we talked about the sort of farewell to summer collection, and now we mm-hmm. also have a fall collection in the shop. And we have some of the fall yarns are Shetland and Romney, the overdyed gray, and then some of our yarns are the replenish Rambouillet. That's the white yarn fingering weight uh, rambouillet that we are now selling so Mm -hmm. we've got a variety in there Uh, i'll tell you what my favorites are 
Uh, I like the Shetland, the pumpkin picking series. I just mm-hmm. love that the sort of eggplant and and rust over the top of, and teal over the top of the gray, and then my other my other two favorites I think are in the Rambouillet, the replenish Rambouillet, and one is is a a pale kind of goldy brown not not pale but goldish brown color that is is called bourbon and suede. It just reminds me of mm-hmm. suede. Well, it reminds me of bourbon and suede. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> bourbon in the glass or like a suede jacket. And then there's another one that has that same color as the base color, but then it has a reddish burgundy color and orange and more orange than the burgundy um, mm-hmm. and splashed over the top of the of that bourbon color. And it's called Just Say No to Pumpkin spice bourbon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so true. Yes, you should say no to pumpkin spice bourbon, but you should not say no to this yarn. Correct. Yeah. It's so no, pretty. it's very pretty. Yeah. It's, it, I think it's one of my favorite. I think that would be, if I had to pick one favorite, I mm-hmm. think that one might be my favorite. It's just really, really pretty. So that's in the shop. Uh, to usefiberadventures.com is the shop. There's a lot to see there. You were talking earlier. I'm going to go off on a little tangent. You were talking earlier mm-hmm. about the shop in Seabrook that, you know, they had locally locally sourced yarns and mm-hmm. they're looking for, you know, local producers and growers and stuff. And I th- I just wanted to mention that that's kind of our goal too, right, to, to mm-hmm. highlight locally produced yarns. And some of them are small batch, like the, the Shetland and the Merino, um, and the Romney are, you know, one or two sheep batches. And then the Replenish Rambouillet is a larger operation that uh, climate beneficial wool comes from a, a larger ranch, but still it's a, you know, small business type ranch. It's just not from one sheep. It's from a larger flock. A lot of the time when you run across that yarn, that type of yarn, it's naturally dyed. Like mm-hmm. the, the yarn that you bought that was dyed with indigo and marigold. Mm-hmm. And, and I love naturally dyed yarn. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes you want different colors than mm-hmm. you can get from naturally dyed yarn. And I think that's what we have in the shop, in our shop. Yeah. We, we don't dye with natural dyes. We use, we use acid dyes. So we just have a different, a different palette of colors mm-hmm. than you would find with the same type of yarn, but in, you know, in the natural dye colors. At the moment, that's kind of our arena. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah. And then if you wanted to support the podcast, but nothing in our shop was up your alley, we also have a Patreon account, a Patreon page, and you could be a Two Use Fiber Adventures patron. And mm-hmm. do you know anything about Patreon, Marsha? Uh, a little bit, but why don't you explain, okay. uh, so, explain to everybody how it works. So the idea is that uh, someone could sign up, they join a tier, and there would be a monthly, you know, they would pay monthly for however many months they wanted to do it. And so we have, it was kind of fun setting up the tiers because you can call them names and then you, you define premiums for each of the tiers. So our first level tier is the Adventure Seeker. And that is uh, $3 a month supporting the show. And then we have the Daring Adventurer tier, which is a $5 uh, per month. And then Intrepid Adventurer, if you were going to support us <laughs> at a $10 a month level. And then the Ultimate Adventurer is the $20 per month level. And there's only four of those available because the, the premiums are in shorter supply so yeah so let me just tell you how it works the three dollar per month level is you know we'll make sure we send you a thank you note um for doing that because we really appreciate the support and then if you joined at the five dollar a month tier at the daring adventurer level uh, we would put you into a quarterly drawing for yarn fiber or other other goodies possibly bee related goodies i don't know 
Mm-hmm. We have some some uh, <laughs> variety there. So that's at the f- uh, $5 a month level. You'd be in a quarterly drawing. And then at the next level, you would be in the quarterly drawing, plus you'd have a 10% discount from the shop. And then this ultimate adventurer level, uh, you would be in the quarterly drawing, you'd have 10% off in the shop, and then we'd also send you an adventure pack with 50 grams of yarn, mini skeins, or fiber bats, and a lip balm from the bees. Mm -hmm. So we have a a variety of premiums at different levels for people who are interested in being a patron of the Two Use Fiber Adventures podcast. (laughs) Yeah. So the money would help to fund, you know, our mailing fees for prizes and purchase Mm -hmm. of prizes and our podcast hosting, all of those expenses that we have monthly, um, these would Mm -hmm. would help to help us defray those costs. So, Kelly, and tell people how they can find our Patreon. Oh, that's a good one. (laughs) That's a good question, Marsha. I'm glad you asked. It's (laughs) That's why I'm the (laughs) co-host. Right. (laughs) Yes. So it's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com forward slash to use patreon.com forward slash to use yeah. and that will okay. get you to our to our patreon page where you can read about it you can see uh, what each of the levels is and if you're interested in the premiums that we have available and if you're interested in supporting the podcast in that particular way yeah so it's exciting yeah it's a fun <laughs> way to um to participate and get some get some good stuff yeah. too Cool. So that's cool. I'm excited. To sh- I'm excited to share this with everyone. Yeah, this gives people a way if they're interested and don't want to add to their stash, which mm-hmm. I know is sometimes the case, mm-hmm. right? Right. They have some okay. other opportunities. Well, any other little bits of business that we need to take? Care I think of? that's it. Well, back to knitting. I, that's all I can do now between <laughs> That's <now> right. <laughs> Go sit and I've knit. been knitting the whole time we've been talking. I think I've done an inch while oh, we've that's been talking. Oh, that's good. But uh, yeah, I got to... Oh, I got to knit because there's the pressures on. Yeah, well, I promise I'll have new projects next time we record. Yeah. Because mine have been a little bit boring. Mm -hmm. I'll be more interesting (laughs) next time. I mean, I'm not saying. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) That sounded like, that sounded like, yeah. Yes, you are boring. No, it's true. (laughs) (laughs) That's not how I meant. No, actually, I'm really interested in your sweater to see how this is going to turn out because um, you're changing so many things and you're making it stripes. I'm interested to see now the whole, yeah. um, the whole finished project. And also, uh, I have a request. Oh, okay. Uh, when you, well, when you, um, post pictures in your project notes, when you finish the two wheeler bind off, put a, um, close up of that. Oh, in okay. Your project page. I'd like to see. I it, should so. do a picture of what it looks like as the two layers. Oh yeah. And then the picture of it. After it's done, the bind off is done. Okay, I'll do that. Sounds yeah. good. That's a good okay. idea. All righty. Okay, we'll talk in two All minutes. right, bye bye. All righty, bye bye. Thank you so much for listening. To subscribe to the podcast, visit twousefiberadventures.com. Join us on our adventures on Ravelry and Instagram. I am Better in Motion, and Kelly is 100 Projects. Until next time, we're the two yous. Doing our part for World Fleece. fleece.